and screen share. You can't find yourself. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, I'm Richard Browick. I'm from Boston University. Uh, I used to do string theory, then I do lattice gauge theory. I guess it's because if I can't solve something analytically, I go and can't solve it numerically, and then I manage to get both sides of the uh, framework. And we'll go around. I guess, should I pass this along? Okay, and our, well, our speaker will be, but we'll introduce him properly later. Uh, hi, I'm Valentio. I'm uh I uh, work at Jefferson Lab, and uh, I, I'm interested in large-scale steel algorithms uh, in particular, and large-scale simulation, new architectures, that kind of thing. Uh, hi, I'm Abdul Abdurrahim from uh, the Cypress Institute. I work on lattice QCD, interested in algorithms and high performance. I am Paul Silva from Coimbra, Portugal, and I'm working on the lattice QCD. Uh, hi, I'm Matthias Rotman from the University of Wuppertal. I'm uh, doing multigrid for lattice QCD and uh, yeah, with uh, emphasis on high performance computing. Um, I am Bjorn Leder. Uh, I'm also from Wuppertal University and uh, uh, I work on lattice QCD and I'm interested in all sorts of algorithmic improvements. Hi, my name is Carson Carr. I'm also from the University of Opata, and uh, I'm also a numerical analysis and work on uh, algorithms, especially multigrid methods for QCD. Uh, James Branick from Penn State. Um, I work on applied math and, in particular, multigrid methods, uh, and some emphasis on QCD the past years. So, uh, okay. Hi, I'm Oliver Witzel. I'm Boston University. I work on QCD and beyond the standard model physics and also algorithms and whatever comes around. I'm uh, Ethan Neal. I'm at the University of Colorado and I work on lattice field theory, mainly for physics beyond the standard model. Well, <laughs> I was specific. <laughs> My favorite what? <laughs> favorite pen color? Uh, blue. <laughs> yeah, we can we can save the comedy for that. Uh, my name is Evan Weinberg. I'm at the will of my boss, Rich Brower. Uh, I'm a grad student at Boston University, and I'm looking at uh, BSM physics on the lattice. Where is this going? Hi, my name is Chris, and I'm a postdoc here at Yale. I work on nuclear structure as well as cold atoms, and so I'm interested in learning more about lattice QCD. Yeah. yeah. I'm Oscar Okilund. I'm a grad student at ETH Zurich, and I yeah, in ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And yeah, I do lattice QCD and some beyond the standard model physics on the lattice. Um, hi, I, I'm Ray Zili. I'm Indiana University. I'm with uh, I'm with uh, Professor Steve Gottlieb, working with him, and uh, I'm more working on the lattice QCD. And right now, I'm in a project of uh, high-performance computing in lattice QCD. 
Um, my phone Lane. I'm at the Brookhaven Lab right now, and uh, I'm mainly working on Lattice QCD. Although I'm actually now in Computational Science Center, so I'm supposed to work on things not just Lattice QCD, which I haven't quite determined yet. Uh, hi, I'm Scott. I'm a grad student at Yale, and I'm just interested in learning about Lattice QCD. Hi, my name is Andy Yasparo. I'm uh, also a grad student here at Yale, and I've been working on uh, uh, lattice field theory for about the past year. Uh, I'm Michael Lujan from George Washington University, and I'm interested in high-performance computing with uh, using Kyle fermions. Oh, I will, but I'm going to switch mics. This is since you're the. Oh. Which some people said they wanted to. Okay. Good. Then uh, they can only hear us if we talk in the mics. The way it's set up. Okay. Uh, so welcome. Uh, here's the organizing committee. Uh, again, just a few uh, things. Why are we here? I even have a... Um... So this QCNA workshop's been around for a long time, and uh, I've been to a few of them. And I went back and I, I managed to get a copy of all of the talks uh, that were given at the original 95 uh, QCNA. My volume is high. Uh, I can, well, because I'm loud. <laughs> uh, this might be better. OK. Um, and in looking at those talks, I realized that you know, for most of my career, uh, mainly we've been focused on efficient, uh, sparse linear solves you know, conjugate gradient and all of its friends. And uh, it seems like for that that's really paradigm is starting to change because although the need for efficient solvers hasn't really gone away, uh, the underlying computational architecture is changing dramatically. As we push towards the exascale, uh, you know, it's going to be, I don't know, GPUs and or whatever. Whatever it is, it's not going to be anything like the nice, uh, massively parallel, well-balanced uh, system of computation and communication that allows you to do a straightforward implementation of a conjugate gradient type algorithm. And so one battle of the changing computational architecture is just you could take your old algorithms and just going through the exercise of re-implementing them as efficiently as possible uh, on the new platform that may or may not be a non-trivial exercise, but it may also be a really stupid exercise because the old algorithm, while it may uh, have excellent performance in terms of uh, counting flops, uh, flops is a highly theoretical thing. What we really care about is time to solution. And so uh, a new algorithm or maybe an old algorithm uh, reimagined on the new architecture may have a much faster time to solution. For example, if your algorithm requires uh, some kind of uh, global reduction uh, and your particular hardware implementation takes a day to do a global reduction, maybe you should find some other algorithm that minimizes the number of global reductions. It may, flops in these machines are basically free or mostly free. And so uh, this is why I think a workshop like QCDNA is, is uh, still relevant today in this world of changing architectures. And I think that you'll see from the talks we have lined up that people are thinking very much in that direction. OK, so this isn't a very informal workshop. Uh, I'll leave it up to each speaker to try and either build discussion into your talk or leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, and at the end of the first day, uh, this was something that we uh, tried to uh, implement recently at a workshop at BU that I really liked, which is try to have an opportunity for uh, people who didn't get a chance to give a presentation to stand up and 
extemporaneously give us a few minutes of just saying what it is that your your research that you're actually trying to do and why you thought coming to this workshop would help you. Um, if you want to flash a slide, you're welcome to flash a slide. Uh, and if nobody stands up, Rich is the backstop who will uh, lead us in a discussion about uh, you know, for, during new, new algorithmic directions for new uh, computational architectures. OK. Um, so we'll have a light breakfast each morning upstairs. Most of you have already seen that. Uh, and then we'll have a, a morning and afternoon break. Uh, for lunch, uh, yellow didn't come out very well. So here we are in Sloan. Um, this is Prospect Street. Uh, and then there's a large uh, hockey rink uh, called the, well, Ingalls Rink. We call it the Whale. You probably saw it when you were walking by, and there's a parking lot out in front. Uh, it may be a little suppressed with the rain, although the rain should end by lunchtime. There will be, uh, it'll be filled with uh, food carts. And so uh, these days, uh, everybody gets their lunch here. The cost is 5 to $7. Um, and we'll, I think we'll just, it's a little bit hard to find seating outside if it's a nice day. Certainly not for everybody, so we should probably just bring them back and eat upstairs in the third floor lounge. Uh, I think that's it. What about getting together for supper and get a restaurant? Yeah, so we'll, uh, yes, we, I was going to plan that out in the breaks or during lunchtime. There are plenty of options. And I will have out, uh, I will put out upstairs uh, some, some uh, list of restaurants, you know. Uh, Right, so we can have a poll or something like that. I'll suggest some options. OK. So then let's switch to Ballant. And we. So the real time is, is, is 45 minutes. Yeah, and, right, but we're not in real danger of running out of time. My clerk's on his way. No, it's James. Okay. Oh, sorry. Use for wireless, use Yale Guest, and then open a web browser, and you should have to click OK, and then you should be there. Do you have it? It's not working. Yeah, I don't. Uh, well, I, okay. Maybe it's your web browser. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. I Or slow. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brandt, and I thought I could use this as a pointer, but it is rather big. So <laughs> you, you'll, you'll see me leaning on it. Uh, I, does the clicker have a laser? Yes. Okay, brilliant. So uh, I was very glad that when we all introduced ourselves that there are a lot of uh, graduate students with us because this is meant to be an introductory talk. And when I sort of thought, who's going to be here? I thought, well, they all know. So uh, but because it's going to be an introductory talk, it's going to focus mostly on, on Lattice QCD. And it's quite sort of colloquial. It's not very formal or rigorous. Uh, uh, and I'm using it mostly to highlight talks that will follow. Um, and then if there is time, one of the things that ended up not making it into this talk is sort of performance aspects on, on various hardware. Again, because I thought you know, that's something Mike is going to address for GPUs. Uh, Ruiz is going to address for Xeon Phi's. But if there is interest, I have some more slides on those that I can always use to fill in any spare time we may have. OK, so let me begin about QCD. So QCD is, is the theory of the strong force. And uh, 
you know, we think of it as quarks and gluons, uh, fields in, in, in a Minkowski space-time. Uh, usually, we write things in terms of path integrals. So if you want to measure some observable O, um, you would measure it uh, in a bit. You, you want to know its value, and you want to weight it with this Boltzmann-like weight. And I guess uh, uh, there should be factors of I floating around here. Uh, and, uh, and this is your path integral. However, uh, this is not very easy to deal with. Maybe if I come to the front, people won't see me on the Hangouts, but uh, I feel more comfortable. So, oh, they can see me. So typically, when we, do, when we deal with these kinds of field theories, we think of them in terms of perturbation theories, like Feynman diagrams. So you can imagine from, from this action deriving a bunch of, of vertices, quarks interacting with gluons, or, or gluons interacting with other gluons. However, if you want to do a numerical calculation, QCD has this problem that, uh, that at, the, at the low energies, perturbation theory doesn't work, and you need to go to some, some different method. So the lattice provides a way to do this. Uh, you take your, your continuum uh, uh, path integral, and you discretize space-time onto, onto a lattice. Uh, you place your quark fields on, on the sides of the lattice, and the, and the gluon fields end up become getting on the links of the lattice, where they act as uh, Wilson lines, little parallel transporters. And I guess the, the, point of the, the major point of the theory is that uh, you maintain your, your gate symmetry. So um, the, if you, you can think about the quark fields on, on the individual sites as having their own internal uh, coordinate system degrees of freedom. And, uh, the, the, the gauge links, which are the parallel transporters, allow you to rotate from one site into the coordinate system on the other site, so you can actually compare these vectors at these sites. Um, if you were to take a, a, a product of any kind of closed loop on the lattice, it would then uh, you could then add arbitrary gauge transformations, uh, and, and you preserve uh, gauge invariance. But from a computational kind of engineering point of view, what I'm really interested in uh, are the states of the links. That's what my sort of Monte Carlo simulations will typically give me. Okay, um, and then uh, the, glue, the 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 spinners we kind of put in later uh, when we want to actually compute some correlation function. I'll get onto that. Let me say a few words about the action. Again, uh, most of you kind of know this. This the sort of simplest lattice action you have is the Wilson plaquette action. Uh, basically, you, you compute the elementary plaquette at every site uh, and in every plane, and you sum it up over all the lattice sites, and uh, you, you multiply it by this factor. Beta is the inverse of your gauge coupling, essentially. Um, and then, of course, you can imagine more elaborate versions of these actions, such as the semantic improved one, where you can add, for example, the rectangle term, which is a six-link term. Okay. And gauge actions in a simulation tend not to pose a really big problem. They're very local. They're well known. Uh, they're straightforward to implement, usually. OK. However, uh, fermions are bad. So uh, because, uh, yeah, so there's a whole slew of, of, of hurt that comes with fermions. Uh, so the, the first easy part is that they're, they're Grassmann numbers. They, they, behave, uh, they have behaved in this funny way. But we can deal with the fact that they're Grassmann numbers by actually just analytically performing this uh, Gaussian integral. And what we end up when we do that is we get a determinant factor. Now, as you all know, determinants are also bad uh, computationally. So uh, you have to play some game. And so typically what we do um, is uh, we rewrite this determinant as, a, as another Gaussian integral over regular uh, fields. Uh, bosonic fields, and these bosonic fields are typically called, called pseudo-fermions. So uh, the only difference uh, is that now you take this m dagger m, and when you, when you write the integral over pseudo-fermionic fields, then uh, you have to use the inverse now. So this, this immediately kind of foreshadows much of our later difficulties with fermions, uh, is that we have to deal with uh, inverses of these fermion matrix. Or, for gate generation, its inverse is usually of m dagger m, which is a relatively nice system because it's manifestly Hermitian, positive definite. Um, if you're doing quark propagator calculations, even that is not always guaranteed. Uh, so, so you have to be careful. Okay, 
So at this point, I will say, and then, of course, fermions are even worse than that because of, of this uh, problem of, of fermion doubling. Now, I, I'm, I'm not sufficiently theoretically versed to go into great details, but the, the, the problem is you can see it in the free field case. If you look at the, the propagator uh, for a fermion, in the, uh, this is the naive fermion, as it were. So if you just took your regular fermion action and you just turned the derivative in the gamma mu d mu into a simple symmetric difference, uh, you end up with these uh, modes, uh, you know, the, the, the propagator will come back to zero again at the end of your uh, brillouin zone. And this looks like uh, another species of fermion, basically. And so for every dimension, you can think you have two, uh, you have two times more fermions. So in four dimensions, you have 16 fermions if you use this naive discretization. This is, this is not good. And in fact, uh, there is, uh, there is a no-go theorem and I think the no-go theorem says, and people working with chiral fermions can correct me on this because I tried to remember it late at night in my hotel room. But it means that you can't have simultaneously all of these four properties. That uh, you have ultra-locality, chiral symmetry, no doublers, and still have the thing look like an actual fermion. Okay, so something has to give. This is not allowed. So. This is why you have a variety of fermion formulations in QCD, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of them here. So the first thing you can do is you can have Wilson-like fermions. And the way they solve this problem is they, they essentially lift your doublers by something that's pro proportional to the inverse of the lattice spacing. And then if you go to the continuum, then these things will become infinitely heavy and decouple from the theory. Okay. Uh, Downside, you've just broken chiral symmetry very, very explicitly. And this can lead to all kinds of numerical problems for you. Um, for example, uh, the quark mass is no longer protected from additive renormalization. And in fact, uh, when, you, when you tune your quark masses, often you'll be in a case where you actually end up having negative bare quark mass parameters. Um, and as you go along, you know, the low modes can shift around so much. You, it's, it, it's problematic. And if you take the, the naive formulation of Wilson fermions, uh, discretization errors creep in at order A. So they're proportional um, to your lattice spacing. Um, there's a way around this. You can, you can use the semantic improvement program to subtract those order A errors uh, using something called the Clover term. However, um, to do that subtraction right, you need to potentially do very careful tuning of the coefficient of that term. Uh, so if you, if you go around and you know, smear your fields and so on, those things, that, that coefficient gets closer and closer to its perturbative value or its three-level three level value. But in principle, uh, the, 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 the non-perturbative determination of, of the clover coefficient can be awkward, especially if you are on an anisotropic lattice. OK, so, so much for Wilson-like fermions. Staggered fermions, I know very little about, which is why there's no picture. Uh, but basically, the basic idea there is that you can take your spin components and you can distribute them around the corners of your hyper elementary hypercubes and reinterpret them. And essentially, this trades off your 16 flavors in four dimension for four flavors. Uh, the other aspect of this in, in terms of implementation is that the, the staggered fermion fields no longer have a spin index as a result of this. They instead have a, a, a sort of checkerboarded phase that changes from one corner of the hypercube to the other. Um, now, the four flavors can still be a bit too much. Uh, so typically what has been happening recently is that people would take the square root of that uh, to get two flavors. And this has been a source of some controversy, but I'm not going to get into that. That's not my uh, business. Um, and finally, um, there's some amount of symmetry going, breaking going on between these uh, various flavors. Um, and uh, this is now being, to reduce this, there have been more and more elaborate staggered formulations, uh, again, using these semantic-like uh, improvement terms. Almost, they have these fat links. So if you hear terms like ASCTAD or now the more popular HISC, fermion, these have some, some extra fat links in the operator to reduce this kind of taste, taste breaking. However, a nice feature is that there's a remnant U1 chiral symmetry that's left over, 
uh, which protects your uh, quark mass uh, from these additive renormalizations, and, and you still have order A squared discretization errors. And uh, Ruizi will talk about implementing staggered fermions Friday. Is that right? Focus on the five, implementation on the five. Okay. So, all right. So then the other solutions you get are the so-called chiral fermions, and there are two kinds, and depending on how you look at them, they're either different or they're all the same. Uh, so uh, you, because you can't have an exact chiral symmetry, which would be gamma 5d plus d gamma 5 equals 0, the closest you can get to it is this kind of... Uh, uh, relation that was given by Ginsburg and Wilson. So one, uh, this allows you to define a chiral symmetry on the lattice in terms of transformations and so on. And there's a solution to it called the overlap operator, which looks like this, uh, if, you, if the massless version anyway. And uh, the problem with this operator is that it needs this kind of sine function to be evaluated in it. So the construction is take your regular Wilson operator, put in it some, some negative mass, and then take the sine function, uh, and then you'll get something uh, that obeys this Ginsburg-Wilson relation. So the sine function kind of looks like this, uh, and I'll get on to this part of the curve later. But before I do that, uh, so this is why I thought that Andreas was going to give a talk about functions of matrices, but uh, he's not here, so... Maybe not. The other aspect is a whole slew of five-dimensional uh, fermion actions, the most popular being the so-called domain wall action. This introduces this fictitious dimension, and sort of in the original formulation of domain wall fermions, uh, the, the idea was that you'd have the chiral modes bound to opposite side, opposite four-dimensional slices of this five-dimensional space, and then they would decay as, as you went away from the walls, uh, exponentially, and if you took the walls far enough apart, you know, one mode would not really feel anything from the other mode because the exponential will have damped it away. Uh, so this this is the this is kind of the picture, but of course, if they if if uh, the length of the fifth dimension is not long enough, uh, there can still be a little residual interaction, and this leads to what is called the residual mass. It, it's a it's a small controllable breaking of, 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 the, of the chiral symmetry. However, another way to think about this is this is just a cunning five-dimensional way of inverting this four-dimensional operator. So you can, you can go and do some maths and show that, uh, that if you take uh, a slightly different Fermian kernel here, and uh, you, rep, you do the sine function by some Cayley Hamilton transformation. Uh, Tony Kennedy will know all this. Then you will get you can go from a domain wall fermion uh, back to an overlap fermion, uh, with the difference that the signum function is evaluated by a hyperbolic tangent. So that's and in fact there are other overlap um, other domain wall formulations uh, where you can uh, replace this. Uh, hyperbolic tangent with a better approximation, such as the Chebyshev approximation given by Zolotarev. This is, uh, for example, in Ting Wai Chu's uh, optimal domain wall fermion formulation. So these are two facets of the same thing. It just depends from which side you approach them. Uh, so this graph kind of just shows if you take these optimal rational approximations, uh, you, you can get bounded errors uh, within a certain approximation range. Uh, when you go out of the range, the errors shoot up, of course. Uh, and then these lines coming down here are what the what the tangent ones would give you. Uh, can we have questions? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. This always sounds like a good idea. Has anybody ever used this in practice and shown that it's a good idea? Um, I thought we did. We did? Yeah, I think back in 2004 or so, we had a lattice talk about, you know, doing hybrid Monte Carlo with this and how the chiral, um, uh, how the chiral symmetry 
braking can be controlled and so on. And I think one of the Japanese groups was using one of our five-dimensional formulations to do their hybrid monitoring. And I think also now some of these some of these other uh, formulations uh, are being used as a preconditioner to the more regular domain wall uh, fermion action mm -hmm. by the Columbia Brookhaven group, I believe. But, I mean, none of them beat Mobius at this point, right? Well, uh, what do you mean by beat? Well, I mean, in practice, get better code. <laughs> well, it depends, right? Because ultimately, Mobius is still a hyperbolic tangent, so you can still do better with the Zolotar of approximation. Well, we can discuss, yeah. yeah, yeah I just was wondering whether there's actually code out there that really so, uses it. So there was, some, some, there, there was code for all of these five-dimensional formulations out there. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the Chroma ones, uh, they had all the relevant features. They had all the operators. And I think some of the bagel libraries actually have optimized versions of this. So OK. Yes? We, this, yeah. I think this is an error. So it's 1 minus epsilon squared. And the numbers are kind of small, because they're just meant to show you that the errors are bounded and that they're within the approximation interval they don't grow. They only grow when you get outside the interval. That's all the picture was meant to illustrate. Because, because basically, you can't see it up here, right? <laughs> it's, so, it's so small, you can't see it up there. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So, so much about fermion formulations. Let me talk a little bit about the observables that you can measure. Uh, well, you can measure all kinds of observables. But if you're going to do any kind of, sort of nuclear physics, Typically, you want to measure observables based on quarks. And to do that, you need to do quark propagators uh, so that you can co construct correlation functions. And so the idea is if you have uh, a quark propagator going one way, you can contract it with a quark propagator going the other way, and you'll get some, some correlation function. You can Fourier, you, typically, it's Fourier transformed. Uh, and then you can look at it as a function of momentum. And you can elaborate, uh, create quite elaborate ones. So you can create, for example, a, a meson, because it's got two quarks there, uh, uh, going into two mesons. Or you can have two mesons going into two mesons, and so forth. Uh, but the point is that uh, the quark propagator is essentially the, the inverse of your fermion matrix applied to a source. So here again, uh, the topic of needing efficient solvers comes in. But uh, hopefully, I will show later, uh, there are some slightly different characteristics for propagator solvers. I mean, you can use the same solvers, but uh, you, can, you can get away with some things when you're doing uh, propagators. And I'll discuss that in a minute. So how do you do an actual lattice calculation? Uh, the machinery is like this. Uh, you take a big computer, and you generate some gauge fields. Uh, and I'll talk about this in the next few slides. That's based on a, a Markov chain, uh, going from one configuration to the next configuration to the next configuration. And so typically, you want to focus as much power on this as you can in terms of hardware. Uh, and the parallelism you have available is just the data parallelism afforded by the fact that you have lots and lots of lattice sites, and you need to do pretty much the same thing at every site. The exception being uh, the solves, which are, of course, non-local. They, they involve the whole lattice. And then uh, after you have your gauge configurations, you want to measure your quark propagators in them uh, uh, to construct your correlation functions. And that admits an extra level of parallelism by the virtue of the fact that you can now treat each of the gauge configurations you've generated uh, independently. And so it's potentially more cost effective to um, to use smaller partitions uh, with bigger local volumes. When you, have slightly, when you have bigger local volumes, your life gets a lot easier, uh, especially if you're using things like GPUs uh, that like to have lots of uh, throughput. And uh, so typically, we do these on clusters. Of course, you can do them on big machines too. But, uh, but it's, it, it's, we, we, we feel it's more cost effective to do them in, in clusters. And then once you have uh, your propagators and correlation functions, you can do a sort of the actual physics analysis where you try and fit the data uh, and extract your energy levels uh, or, or your nuclear structure, structure observables or, or whatever it is you're after. Okay. So 
the next part, I'm going to say a few words about generating these gauge configurations. And uh, so kind of just to give you the idea, um, I have here what used to be a big lattice, 32 cube by 256. And every year, I, when I have this slide, I have to change it to what is the most recent big lattice, because this is now actually not that big a lattice. Um, so there are people working with uh, 64 cube lattices, and I think in the mill collaboration, even like 96 cube by 144. So the lattices get bigger, uh, which makes this point even more poignant. You have millions and millions and millions of links on your lattice. Uh, and so you can't carry out your, your, uh, your uh, four volume dimensional integral directly. Uh, and so you have to turn to these Monte Carlo methods. So the idea there is that I'm going to change my integral into a sum uh, over some samples. And I will, each sample is one of my configurations. I will measure my uh, observable in each configuration. And I have to weight it with its probability. And this is easy. Uh, but the problem is uh, that uh, it's, it's shown here. If you've got a distribution of something and you just randomly pick points in it, uh, the likelihood of, uh, of hitting in the equilibrium distribution where things are important is small. So you don't want to do this kind of thing. You want to do something smarter. Okay? So the smarter thing to do is something known as important sampling. Uh, and important sampling tries to pick each configuration u with its desired probability u. And if you do this, uh, the, the sort of pu factor kind of is included in the fact that this configuration is in, in the sum at all. And so first of all, your sums become more straightforward. Uh, and uh, your errors will go down as 1 over the square root of n. And the typical example for this is Metropolis's algorithm, which says you start from one place, you go to the next place. There's this condition that the transition from one configuration to the next, uh, the probability of that transition has to be reversible. This is a sufficient condition, not a necessary one. But it's, it's sufficient uh, uh, to ensure a, a property called detailed balance. And then, that, then you can prove that your Markov chain will, will converge onto the equilibrium distribution you want. Uh, and so what you tend to do is you, you, you pick a new configuration, and you accept it with this metropolis probability, uh, which is basically the ratio of, of the actions, uh, or, or 1, if this ratio is uh, whichever is smaller. And you can think of it as this idea that I'm looking now from above down at that probability distribution. This is kind of the peak region in here. These are the outlier regions. And you start from a position, and you go to a place that's much more likely, oh, sorry, much less likely. You, know, you might end up rejecting that. So instead, then you'll start going to the next place. Oh, this is more likely. You're more likely to accept that. And so you kind of wander around, and hopefully you wander around in this region, which is important. OK? That's, that's the basic idea. So, but now, those pesky fermions, they, they come back to bite you. Because if all you did is visit every link in sequence, pick a new link, then you have to do the accept reject. And to do the accept reject, you have to evaluate the action. And that would mean you'd have to evaluate the fermionic action. And so you'd have to solve the system of equations uh, and you simply have to do this every single time for every single ch change you make to a link. And that's bad, because that's very, very costly, right? That's unfeasible. And so you want to go to a method which can do global updating or less local updating, I guess. And this is where we come to our friend, Hybrid Monte Carlo. Uh, and the big trick, this, is, this, is, this relies on a big trick. The big trick is that. Here, I'm going to write p's for conjugate momenta. Uh, the idea is that you, you look at your system, you look at all your u links, and you say, every single link I will treat as a coordinate. And, and I will draw for every single link a corresponding canonical momentum. Uh, and I will define a Hamiltonian, which is just going to be the extension of my action with this half p squared part. And then uh, I can carry out this integral and I will integrate over both the, the uh, coordinates and the momenta. And instead of the action now, I'm going to use the Hamiltonian as the weight. But this is OK, because this will decouple very nicely. 
in the end. So in the end, when I have an observable and I take the 1 over z factor, this constant will disappear between from the path integral completely. However, by, by virtue of introducing this momentum, I can now choose my configuration uh, using a method that can give me a global change that's large and it's likely to be accepted. So here's the recipe. You start out at the, at the beginning with some configuration u and you generate some momenta. You can pretty much throw away the old ones uh, depending on whether you want to do generalized hybrid Monte Carlo or just regular hybrid Monte Carlo, you can either completely refresh them or refresh a portion of them. Uh, and uh, you evaluate your, your energy. So far, this is the same as the metropolis. But then the way to choose what that will do, though, is it will boost you to a new plane of constant H. Then you perform molecular dynamics. Uh, and the difference between like a talk I would give and a talk that say Tony would give is that Tony would then show you all the differential geometry that makes this work. Uh, I can't do that. So I'm just going to say you do molecular dynamics and uh, the requirement is that this molecular dynamics uh, be uh, reversible and area preserving. That's just required to keep this probability of choosing the new configuration from the old configuration the same as going the other way around. That's, that's all that does. Uh, and then you will compute your, your energy change at the end, and you will accept with the metropolis probability that's basically the difference of the energies. If you reject, you go back, of course, to the old state, as in the regular metropolis algorithm. And so the big advantage of this is you have an energy conserving system. So in principle, if you do molecular dynamics, you should have if you didn't have any numerical artifacts from the integration or whatever, your energy should be strictly preserved. And so you should accept it. Uh, now, of course, you're going to do uh, molecular dynamics with some algorithm uh, that numerically integrates uh, with some step size your equations of motion. So you will have a, a step size error, which can change this to be uh, not zero anymore. But you can, in principle, then uh, control that error or control your energy change along a trajectory by tuning your step size, making it smaller and smaller. Okay? Uh, you still need to be ergodic, which means the ability to explore all of the phase space, which is why you need these momentum refreshes to keep boosting you to different hyperplanes of constant energy. And that's hybrid Monte Carlo uh, in a nutshell. So, just to say a few things, uh, the acceptance rate uh, goes as this, as, as this error function of your uh, energy change squared. And here's a graph. It's actually, this is actually a slightly different delta H squared. It's from a paper uh, that Paolo here wrote. This is, so it's a slightly different one, but it shows the same kind of error function. So I, I, I took the picture anyway. Uh, and so the, the point is uh, that this just underlines the point I made earlier that if, if you want to increase your acceptance rate, you can just decrease your step size a little bit. And uh, the other thing is that if you have uh, uh, a, a, an integration scheme that's accurate to order uh, dt to the n, uh, then uh, if you want to keep uh, uh, the constant step size, you, you have to scale uh, your dt like, like so. You, you want to keep this term kind of constant. So if you, if you grow your volume, you'll need to change the step size down uh, to keep the acceptance rate constant. OK. So a few things about molecular dynamics integrators. Yes, sir? What's the acceptance rate like in practice? So in practice, there are, there are various sort of peop, uh, papers on the, what's considered optimal. Because if you have it very, very high, in principle, it might be because you have a very, very small step size and, and you're not making much progress in, in the phase space. And obviously, if you have it very, very low, then you're always rejecting. So when I run simulations, typically I keep it around, I try to keep it between 70 and 80%. Uh, but there are slightly more formal discussions based on, on this uh, scaling behavior that would maybe say, I think, something like 66 is better. Or, But the point is, I, Around 70 is a good engineering number. OK. So as I mentioned, 
uh, the MD indicators must be both reversible and, uh, and uh, phase space measure preserving. And this is a shame because it knocks out some really sophisticated time integrators that are out there. Uh, and typically, we will work with, uh, uh, instead, these uh, symmetric symplectic schemes. Uh, the most straightforward one that is, is oh, my laser light's going. The most, the most straightforward one is this leapfrog idea that you update your momentum with a half a step, then you update your gauge fields, then you update your momentum again. And you can see that by construction, this is reversible, right? If you just flip the signs of all these t's, you'll, you'll, you'll get back to where you started. And each individual piece itself is uh, area preserving, so the product of them is also area preserving. Uh, and we've been using this for the longest of, of time. However, uh, there have been, uh, you, can, you can imagine more elaborate constructions. Uh, for example, I think, I think the foreground and Takahashi brought these integrators over from astronomy uh, into, into lattice QCD. Uh, these are sometimes uh, called the Omelian type integrators in lattice QCD. So uh, you have a slightly more general version of the leapfrog, right? You, 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 if you imagine this lambda was zero, then you would recover leapfrog, essentially. Okay? Because if lambda was zero, these two guys uh, would go away, and this two lambda will go away, and you'd get back to leapfrog. Yes? Well, they are there to ensure detailed balance, which is a sufficiency condition. So it's not necessarily guaranteed, uh, but the fact that you have them uh, allows you to feel comfortable that things will work. No, but I think the answer is violent. It's wrong. Yeah, it's well, it's a sufficiency, not a necessity. I didn't say it was sufficient. No, I'm sorry. If, if you don't do this, it'll be the wrong distribution. Well, well, what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, that exact reversibility is a sufficient condition for detailed balance. You can have detailed balance without that condition, but you, it's hard to prove then. So, so I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't be able to prove that it's right, which means that it may well be wrong. I could, be, I could be wrong, but if you don't change the algorithm otherwise and simply don't have reversibility, I think you'll get the wrong distribution. Yeah, probably. I mean, you might maybe do some other trick to compensate for it. Yeah, yeah. As written down, this algorithm is wrong. Right. So right. Case, right. Yeah, I, w I would go. With, yeah, I certainly want to maintain reversibility because having a guarantee I mean, is good. Way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could presumably so if if you didn't have the area preservation, you could presumably do an accept reject at the end to account for that if you could find out the amount of that. But yeah, and and as I say, the the. Having reversibility is, is sufficient for detailed balance, but you can have detailed balance without reversibility, but not, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. I, I really wouldn't dare. Reverse, reverse, probably uh, violated by round up error. Yeah, so, so yes, this is an interesting point. So one of the things, let me get on, I'll, I'll get right on to that. Okay. That, that. That takes me to hopefully, hopefully the next point. So hybrid Monte Carlo with fermions. So the fermions have this pseudo-fermion action here. OK? Uh, and the question is, how do we fold this into the process I just outlined to you? And uh, the idea is now you, of course, have to carry out an integral over the pseudo-fermions as well. And so one way to do that uh, it would be every now and again to just refresh the pseudo-fermion fields. Yeah, just pull some new ones from the heat bath if you can do it. And actually, you, you can do it, because you could just write this, uh, uh, this fermion action as this eta dagger eta. Uh, which with the minus sign will turn it into a Gaussian integral, and we can sample Gaussian in, uh, we can sample Gaussian distributions. So we can just draw a Gaussian for eta, and then we can construct phi in this manner. Okay. So if at the start of every trajectory we we, we draw some fermion fields uh, by 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 this method, uh, then we can just keep them constant through our integration. You don't have to make them a dynamical a dynamical variable in that sense. Um, and you get a force term associated uh, with those pseudo-Fermian fields, which looks like the following. And this will get back to Rich's point in just a minute. Uh, okay? 
So uh, when you're doing your momentum update, you basically take the old momentum and you multiply it by the force times the step size. And if you have a two-flavor quark action, uh, again, uh, this, I'm not going to do all the variational analysis. I'm just going to say the dumb way to differentiate it with respect to time is this way. And you see you need to evaluate uh, this large system of equations again. So the solvers come in here. You have to do a solve every time. Uh, you're, you're in a good space because this is a manifestly higher emission positive system, but uh, this, the condition number of this system is the square of the condition number of either this system with a single M or with M dagger. So one of the standard tricks to do is to do a two-step solve uh, to evaluate this, just on the premise that uh, two times uh, the square root is, is less than this, uh, the, uh, the actual number. And the other point is that because you're updating now your gauge fields with every step, your gauge fields change. On every step, uh, uh, this n will change. And so this, this is a pain because if you have a really, really fast solver, uh, but it has a long setup cost, you can't amortize it over multiple solves because your field changes. And I should, at this point, say uh, this is an allusion to multigrid, of course. And and Maifang will talk about uh, uh, about multigrid in HMC later on in this workshop. Now, to get back to Rich's point, one of the standard tricks you play when you do this game is you keep track of your old solutions, right? This is something called a chronological solver, although I think the best way to think of it is a chronological guess to the solution, OK? So you, you do your solve. You get your solution. You sort of put it off into some store. And then you take your step. You have to do your next solve. And you're going to use the solutions you have stored. You know, And there are various ways you can do this. You can just do a linear extrapolation, or you can go to a very sophisticated minimal residual uh, ex 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 uh, extrapolation. But the point is, doing that violates your reversibility in principle. Because if you came the other way, you'd have different vectors in your store. Exactly. But this is, this is kind of, this, and this is kind of one of those philosophical discussions. Ultimately, there is only the solution. But then, in principle, you have to solve to like machine precision so that it doesn't really matter which direction you came from. But if you want to not solve to machine precision, then in principle, the chronology uh, can, can hurt your reversibility. The other thing that can hurt your reversibility, you know, in the molecular dynamics, you don't necessarily care if you're following some rigorous trajectory as long as you get from point A to point B reversibly with a small energy change. You can take a variety of paths. You can imagine solving your system of equations not very accurately at all. And there are studies there that, out there that show that as you solve your system less and less and less and less accurately, it's kind of like taking a bigger and bigger and bigger step. Um, and maybe because this, you know, if you don't, if you don't converge down to the to the real solution, you'll get large noise in your forces, um, and that can actually drive your integration unstable even. And it will also increase your reversibility uh, violations. You can measure it. Okay, so hopefully. Did that answer your? Yeah, pretty much. I was just wondering, actually, just even MD with finite arithmetic was not a reversible error. Right. And in fact, if we don't use the mic for questions, you should restate yes. the question because it's not a problem. So, so Rich was saying, probably if you're not using infinite precision, or, 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 well, if you're using any kind of finite precision arithmetic, probably your molecular dynamics is, strictly speaking, non-reversible. And I think this is true, but the amount of reversibility violations from that are small. I think I've measured that, too, at one point. Unless you get into some chaotic system where it And it is, it is chaotic. So the molecular dynamics, you can characterize the amount of chaos with the Lyapunov exponent. And you can, it's, it seems, typically, it's OK, papers out there by Edwards, uh, Kennedy, and Horvat, and also by Edwards, uh, Kennedy, and myself. We measure this in systems of various volumes. So uh, you know, you keep your step size fixed, and, and your Lyapunov exponent is nice and stable, showing that the amount of chaos is not really changing. And then you reach the instability point, these things shoot up. I, I, I can dig out a figure at some point, but there are studies about that. 
OK. So then the other game you can play with these integrators is you can, you can uh, imagine splitting your action into pieces. So if you have an action which is made, say, from S1 and S2, and the momentum updates are respectively operators P1 and P2, then you can construct this nested uh, algorithm. Uh, and to give you a, an analogy, uh, this is your original leapfrog integration uh, with uh, the gauge update and uh, updates from both S1 and S2 together. And you can kind of break it into just momentum updates uh, with S2 or P2. And then on this more fine time scale, you can see the momentum updates are now smaller. And that's just being done uh, with P1. And so the idea here is if the momentum updates of, uh, of P2 uh, or the for the, if the forces coming from the action P2 are small, then you can run it on a longer time step. Okay? And uh, this, this, rec this recursive way, you can, you can then create lots of time steps. And I'll get onto this in a minute, too. So typically, your action is made up of several pieces. Uh, you can use, say, a gauge action for gluons. You can have a light quark action. You can have a strange quark action. And they will all have these different forces. So what I'm trying to show in, in this kind of picture, the height of the bump is meant to be some kind of norm on the force. And you can, the sort of heuristic tuning is that, that uh, you want to always run at the largest step size at each level for which your integrator is stable. And uh, so you want to try and uh, somehow arrange your step sizes and pieces of action on the various levels so that the force times the step size is more or less constant. Okay, this is uh, something that was introduced uh, by, by uh, Urbach, uh, Janssen, Schindler, and Wenger when they refer to it as mass preconditioning. And so how can you use this? You can imagine using a trick that was due to Hasenbusch. If you've got some determinant, you can trivially multiply it by 1, okay? But uh, by multiplying it by the, some other determinant over itself. And if you do this, the corresponding pseudo-Fermian action will now have two pieces. Uh, this piece here is due to the ratio. And the second piece here is due to this cancellation piece. Okay. Now, what has this done for you? Uh, first of all, you now have two pseudo-Fermian fields you have in your action. Second of all, this ratio piece, if you, if you pick it right, so you can use, for example, either exactly the same Fermion matrix, but add a little twisted mass to one of them, and you can control the amount of twisting. Or you can imagine taking the uh, Fermion matrix in the, in the numerator, and the one in the denominator is maybe slightly heavier, but not too much heavier. And then this will look like the identity plus some, some small change. And then you know that if you then take the derivative, this identity has zero derivative, of course, and you will have a small force that's sort of proportional to this, this delta factor. And if you have a small force, then you can run it on a longer time scale. That's kind of the game you can play. And you can carry on. You could have more ratios here. So you can precondition M1 with an M2, and, and so on, and so on. So another trick you can play uh, is the so-called multi-pseudo-Fermian trick. Uh, which was thought of by Mike Clark and Tony Kennedy, their idea was that, well, the determinant is really just the product of n nth roots, okay? Which is kind of, you know, originally when, when, this first, when the Hasenbusch trick came along, uh, before, they, this, before it was realized that you could run the separate pieces on different timescales, the idea was to try and, and engineer this uh, split so that you would essentially take the square root of the condition number. And, and that's when Mike and Tony said, hell, you know, why don't we come along and take the square root of the condition number, or the nth root, or so on. And so uh, you can rewrite this basically as n pseudo-Fermian fields. Uh, you typically want to evaluate this nth root with some, some rational approximation. And then, again, you can take bigger time steps. And I, the fact that you've got more pseudo-Fermian fields here also helps you're essentially sampling that determinant better. So it helps with your integration stability. Okay. All right. But of course, now I want to talk about some work that, that Paolo here has been very intimately involved in, Mike Clark as well, Tony Kennedy, even I did a tiny little bit. And also 
uh, for the main wall. Uh, Han Tao Yin has, has been working on this with Bob Mawini. And this is the idea of, of using shadow Hamiltonians uh, to either tune or improve your integration schemes. So the basic idea is that if you combine symplectic updates, like your momentum and, 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 and gauge updates, uh, you, because these are not numbers, you can't just add those things in the exponent. They're matrices. So you have to use the bacon campbell hausdorff uh, uh, formula to, to get the effective uh, uh, result. And so if you look at some integrator, like the Omelian integrator, the generalized leapfrog, if you crank the handle of the, of the Baker-Campbell Hausdorff formula, uh, you, will, you will end up with an e to an h prime times delta t. And h prime looks kind of like this. So uh, in particular, uh, you can imagine that you could play games with this lambda to reduce the sizes of these terms. And then the next term comes in at order dt4. And so this, this, uh, this h prime thing is called the shadow Hamiltonian. And your integration scheme conserves this exactly. And by exactly, I mean, I mean there's still numerical machine precision type issues, but there's no step size error. OK? So uh, and, and you can actually measure those commutators. Because, because QCD is an extensive system, you can measure those commutators by measuring uh, these Poisson brackets over here, okay? And so you could imagine that if you could measure these Poisson brackets, uh, you could potentially evolve them as well. If you can evolve them, uh, you, you, you can get to a force gradient integrator, which is fourth order or, or fifth per time step. I always get those mixed about. I think it's fourth order over a whole trajectory. Um, and so to give you some idea of how this works, uh, here are some, some measurements we did uh, when Paolo visited us uh, at Jefferson Lab a few years back uh, with Crow and, and Tony. So this is just for a Wilson gauge. And uh, I don't know if we even had Wilson fermions in here. But you can see uh, that, uh, let's see, what, what are the, I lost my legend, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is your energy change. Right? And it's a leapfrog integrator, so it's second over order over trajectory. And you can see that the gradient of this line is indeed close to 2. So that's fine. Uh, and then if you look at the shadow Hamiltonian, you can also measure it. Uh, and you can see that it is indeed uh, the next order up, fourth order. And uh, if you implement a for force gradient integrator, uh, then you can now see that the energy change uh, is fourth order, as promised, and then the next, uh, the, the, the shadow Hamiltonian at next order is, uh, is dt6. So the, the, this actually all works. And I think one of the, one of the issues, uh, it's, it's straightforward to implement for the gauge action. It's, it's harder to implement for the Wilson action, but still straightforward. And then with Clover, because you have these nonlinear products of the Clover leaves, I think that's where we got stuck, essentially. And it's more or less stuck there for me ever since. So, but this, this is a, a way to potentially get a fourth order integrator without the sort of s s five or six force evaluations you need per, uh, 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 per update. OK. So I'm uh, moving along in time. Let me say a few things about the analysis. So at, at JLab, we're very big fans of this distillation technique of analysis. Um, it involves uh, basically propagator calculations, as, as all of these analyses do. And then you want to contract your, your propagators. And, uh, but the important point is roughly how many solves we need on a single configurations. So first of all, we need a number of, of, of sources. These are eigenvalues of, of your th uh, three-dimensional lattice Laplacian living on a single time slice. That's kind of your source. And uh, so you will have uh, the number of these is going to be your number of your spin components, uh, number of your time slices. Uh, the number of your eigenvectors, and the number of quarks, because you need to do separate solves for, for light and strange quarks. And so if you look at one of those examples that I showed you for a 32 cube by 256 lattice, you will need four, so four spins, 256 time slices, 386 source vectors, and you also need 
times two quarks for light and strange. And if you multiply all these numbers up, you get a whopping huge 790,000 individual solves per configuration. That's a lot. And uh, if you get bigger lattices, you will need more sources because they kind of grow with the volume. Um, and so you can imagine this number growing into the millions. So that's a lot of solves. Okay. And so that brings me to my final topic before I finish up. And this is going to be a very lightweight treatment because there are much, much more expert solver guys in the audience than here. So traditionally, we used to solve uh, these systems with Krilov subspace, as George said, conjugate gradients and his friends. So I think this is conjugate gradients. Right here, I, I copied the algorithm from somewhere. It uses M dagger M, so I'm, I'm guessing it is. Uh, but uh, we also have been using, for example, BICG stab. Uh, but the problem with this is that as you push your quark mass down to the, to the physical uh, mass, uh, these systems become more and more ill-conditioned, and you get a critical slowing down in the solver. And I'll have a graph about that later. Before I go on to that, the other aspect is implementing these solvers efficiently on, on architectures. So if you look, for example, in this algorithm, it's got one, two. Uh, maybe three inner products that you have to evaluate, so that's global reductions for you. Uh, that that can be costly, uh, it's sort of latency driven. Uh, you also have lots of vector vector type operations that can, that can be costly for you because that's going to be memory bandwidth bound with no cache reuse at, at all. Um, and then you have the matrix applications, of course, and that will be costly for you because that's both communications and memory bandwidth bound. So. Uh, so you have two aspects. You have uh, the fact that you will have critical solving down, slowing down coming from the physics, but you also have the aspect that all of these things are working against you in terms of scalability and in terms of performance. So uh, one aspect that I guess Mike will maybe talk about more, uh, one of the ways people have been working to get around scalability uh, is to use domain decomposition, uh, domain decomposed preconditioners. So the idea behind the domain decomposed preconditioner is that uh, you, you can, this is, this is kind of a schematic picture of your fermion matrix, right? These, these little lines on the diagonal are meant to be your neighbors in various dimensions. And so a block diagonal approach would simply cut out a bunch of those. And how many you cut out would kind of depend on your block size. Uh, and then you would just have an operator that would just be these blocks. And they may or may not overlap very much. You could arrange it so that they never overlap. If they never overlap, you never have to communicate. You can just deal with them completely independently, and you've, you've removed one scaling bottleneck, which is the nearest neighbor communication in these uh, solvers. However, um, this, this helps uh, on architectures where communication is a bottleneck, right? Uh, however, it's also kind of a wavelength filter. It only deals with the wavelengths that can be supported by the physical sizes of these blocks. Other wavelengths that are longer than this have to be handled somehow. So that's why typically you don't do the entire solve as a domain decomposed solve. You use it as a preconditioner, and then you have an outer process to take care of those long wavelength modes. Uh, for example, uh, you, can, you, can, you have to use uh, some reliable outer method like FGM res or GCR, and then you can also play games where you uh, in between restarts of FGM res, you can deflate spaces you've already found. So there's an algorithm for that by, by Andreas as well. And it's because it deals specifically with long wavelength, uh, sorry, with short wavelength modes, it's very suitable as a, as a smoother in, in multi-grid type approaches. And, and there will be a talk about that, I guess, two talks away from this one. Okay? But just to show you, this really helps. And to show you how the other approaches are actually bad. Right. This is some results we've taken uh, on uh, on Titan, which is a big system uh, that we use at Oak Ridge. It used to be the world number one. I think now it's the world number two, and it's made up basically of roughly 18,600 nodes, and each node has a regular CPU and a GPU. So we've, we've put the GPU solver in the CUDA library, and we ran some performance. And these two lines down here, uh, the, the green and the black are your regular by CG step. And they're bottlenecked by all these features I told you about, mostly communication. And you can see that the scaling flattens out uh, for a relatively small number of GPUs already. 
But by playing a domain decomposition game combined with GCR in this instance, you can maintain scalability to much higher processor counts. So that's, yes? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was not meant to be anything other than illustrative, just to show you what I meant by block diagonal. So you could you could imagine constructing a block diagonal uh, overlap uh, operator, but I'm not 100% sure how. However, the good news is I think there is a talk about using multigrid in overlap. That's in this workshop, right? So, so that might. It would have to be, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I know similar algorithms on things which are literally long range, but are dominant and they still work. And you, so you probably yeah. get away with it. I mean, the one way of one, one very dumb way of constructing one of these is just to take your d slash and turn off communications in it, and you can do that in your overlap too. So you could have the sign function of an operator in principle that that doesn't do communication. Although it might not help you too much because you. Well, it depends how you evaluate your sign function. Yeah. Yeah. And the longest um, how dependent is on the time condition now? If I do three hundred SME, do I see much of the gain compared to non standard solvers compared to going up to two hundred? So I would I have not Yeah, so so the question was well, how does domain decomposition uh, well, how does it work if you if you lower your pi on mass? And I would say the answer to that depends on how you construct your outer process. Because as you make your pi on mass lighter and lighter, you'll have more long wavelength modes. And if you have a, a, a small domain that cannot support that wavelength, then it will not be your, your domain decomposed operator that deals with those modes. It'll be the outer process for which the domain decomposed mode is a preconditioner. And this can still be very effective. So if you use FGM res with deflation, uh, I think uh, in recent work uh, I've seen um, good, uh, it, it was well behaved at like 190 MeV-ish mass. Please, yes. Uh, also find that you have to have the auto process a lot of, um, uh, you have to store a lot of restart that's going to be very, very long. Yeah, so. At some point you run into yeah. So, so just to repeat for people, because I have the mic, uh, uh, the 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 restart length of the GMRS process has to be long. You have to keep a long history. As as you push the pi on mass down, that subspace needs to be bigger and bigger. Thank you. But is it is this method, this method supposed to be the pi on mass? The dom the domain decomposition in itself will not remove your critical slowing down. But let me get on to the next part. You can get to algebraic multigrid methods. And again, I'm a novice in this, so I'm going to say what I learned from it in an, an kind of an engineering mode, as it were. Uh, so the basic idea is that you try and separate your high lying and low lying modes. And one way to do that is by blocking, right? Because if you have a certain block size, that'll give you a subset of, of certain wavelengths. And then you can solve. On your coarse grid, you have, few, you have much fewer degrees of freedom. You can do it quite efficiently. Uh, and so you can. this is kind of the essence of the multigrid technique. And there will be much more detailed and rigorous talks about multigrid, so please don't shoot me. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is work that most of the people who are at this workshop, uh, who are at this workshop are, have, are or have been engaged in. And I'm now talking Rich, James, uh, uh, you guys, I haven't met you very much before, so I don't remember. But but this is a big, deep interest, uh, OK? Uh, but the point about this is it can give you a 10 to 12 times speed up over a conventional solver at a low pile mass. So I know these configurations. These are, are anisotropic clover configurations. And I know that this mass is around 230 MeV, uh, this, this 860 guy. Um, and there you can get a 10 to 12 percent, uh, 12 times speed up over uh, by CG stab. And uh, Mike isn't here, so I can say this. On the GPU, you get eight or nine. So you can beat the GPU 
on a CPU with multi-grid. And so we need multi-grid on the GPU to combine these efficiency gains, OK? Uh, all right. And uh, in fact, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. So let me sum up. I'm pretty much on time. So I think the basic message, the most important message, is that fermions are troublesome. And no matter which approach you take, you will give up something. And you have to choose what you give up. And whether you give up uh, explicit uh, chiral symmetry or whether you give up uh, some other feature, or whether you're going to increase your cost, or so on. Um, and so dealing with fermions is the predominant cost of HFC simulations. Uh, I think solver typically accounts for 60 to 80% of your simulation. And the remaining sort of 20% is to do with evaluating the non-solver force parts. And I think the remaining 5% is your gauge action and, your, and the rest. So it's a, it is the dominant cost. So you can have, using these shadow Hamiltonian techniques, better tuning of your integrators. So you can take bigger steps. That really helps. That reduces the number of solves, amongst others. Uh, and you, you also have the promise of cheaper fourth order uh, integrators. And of course, to round off this talk, we always want better solvers. AMG has been highly successful uh, for our propagator calculations with Wilson fermions. And uh, by that, I mean is it makes those 700,000 solves actually tractable. And what we'd really like is maybe another factor of four. If you could get it from, from architecture or, or further algorithmic gain, then we'd be really happy. Uh, at least four. I don't stop at four, by all but <laughs> at least four. Uh, and then, so you should see follow-on talks. There are some nice talks by Branek, Rotman, Carl, uh, relating to various aspects. Uh, the domain decomposed uh, preconditioners have been shown themselves to be very scalable for Wilson fermions. So I showed you the example here for GPUs. I think Tilo Vettig at the Lattice Conference might talk about this for Xeon Phi. Uh, and I guess one of the next frontiers uh, is to see if you can apply multi-grid to uh, hybrid Monte Carlo, where you have this problem of, of the gauge field changing along your trajectories. There will be a talk about that by Mei Feng. And uh, at this point, uh, I will finish and let all those other talks take place. Thank you. Well, we're amazingly on time. Is here? Hello? It's on. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for the overview. Uh, I, I just wanted to add, um, since this uh, is an overview of um, that is QCD and maybe also the problems that um, appear. Um, there's also the problem of autocorrelations um, that you have when you use. <laughs> yes, yes, I didn't. You were expecting those. this from me, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, I, I think this is really also a problem that we will be facing in the coming years because um, I think all groups see this problem of. Um, um, increasing autocollation times and uh, as soon as you're going to lattice spacings of uh, 0 0.05 Fermi and down uh, below that, then um, uh, we have these problems. And uh, okay, I mean, this is a, a totally different kind of direction. I mean, that's mm -hmm. where algorithmic improvements might be needed. No, thank you for bringing that up, actually. And I remember uh, when I was a when I was a PhD student, I actually spent lots of time trying to measure uh, autocorrelation times, uh, which is hard, of course. And uh, so at that time, there's not been that many solutions. One, one solution that was proposed, uh, I guess the autocorrelation time is perhaps worse for these topological observables. And that um, one solution that was proposed is the use of tempering algorithms. Uh, and uh, I, certainly from my own perspective, I, I've played with that during my PhD. But at that time, I don't think we were in a light enough mass regime where we could make a serious dint with it. So, so maybe it could be time to revisit those algorithms again. Uh, are there any other questions? 
No, actually, I have a question about this uh, reversibility breaking when you do these updates. Like, ha how have this been, like, actually, like, measured or observed, or it is just assumed that it will exist if you do that? Right. Well, you can certainly measure reversibility violations. There, you know, this is typically done. Um, what you would do is, you, you know, you'd, you'd go forward, and then you'd come and flip your momenta and come back again, and then you can take a difference of your gauge fields and, and some norm. And, uh, you know, this is something people frequently do, like every 10 trajectories of their HMC simulations, just to make sure that it's under control. Um, increases in reversibility violations have been correlated, I guess, with with integrator instabilities. I know that much for sure. Um, and then beyond that, what I don't know is whether there has been any systematic study that would look at concrete effects in observables. So I don't know if anyone has done any kind of simulation where they try to somehow control this, right? Because it's very difficult to control it, right? You have some. Uh, you could imagine you could make your reversibility violation worse by, for example, loosening your solver or something. But if you do it too much, then your integrator will go unstable and you won't be able to generate an ensemble to look for the effect on the observable. And I think the other aspect is that this tends to get worse with larger volumes and then these kinds of tests become really, really expensive. So, no, I mean, does this mean that you cannot do this operation of using the previous solves to update? To, for oh, people do it regularly anyway. So, so it's not, it's not a problem. Well, the, the business of using previous guesses, that's kind of a, a fairly shady area because, because there is this point of view that a solution is a solution and there's only one solution, yes. right? That's so that's kind of a, you can imagine maybe getting away with it there or, or perhaps controlling it by picking a level of accuracy that you feel comfortable with. But other situations, like using a non uh, explicitly non-reversible integrator, I wouldn't. No, I meant, I, I was yeah. exactly talking about this using the previous solutions to get a new solution. This is, this is what I'm... This is something that's done on a regular so basis. It's not, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, this is very, very interesting. By the way, I've been making a list of, uh, I, got, I think I got eight things uh, to, to your remark that are sitting on the horizon scaring me. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about them at the end of the day. But I, mean, I think that uh, if you look at where we're headed, there actually was a talk by Martin Lucier a couple of weeks ago on what, what would happen if we had to go to really large lattices. And really, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so um, I think there are many, many problems. But on this question of inverters, I mean, clearly, uh, James Brannick keeps em emphasizing it. Multigrid and domain decomposition work at two ends of the problem. And so it begs for some synthesis. And I think that's a huge um, area of research, right? Because multigrid tries to get the long distance stuff to go faster. And domain decomposition crowds your pr yourself onto the short distance. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you want to do some of both. And um, you know what synthesis there takes place is, uh, and then the problem is going to be, we really need the software, the software side, we need to have lots of different kinds of adaptive libraries, but we're not going to use the best uh, algorithms. They're getting so complex. And we'll have lots of them. I see them, all of them. And you actually ask, what are people using in their simulations? They're way behind even the state of the art that we have here. And so we got to think about how we pull these things in and sort of automatically adapt, change the domain decomposition, the, the, the structure due to the architecture, so that we're actually even using the best that we've got now, right? Uh, I think we're, we're getting away from everybody writes their own and, and hopes that it's the best. Um, but Belind will actually, I think, solve that whole software project and inside something. But I think it's a real problem. Our algorithms are getting complicated enough that not, we're not even using the best ones uh, in practice. Anyway, thank you very much. It was a terrific talk, and I'm sure many questions will come up. Any more questions right now? We have plenty of coffee upstairs, and then uh, James, you're next. Okay, thanks a lot. It's terrific. It was perfect. What? What was terrific? It was perfect. No. <laughs>